So I want to welcome everybody to this room. Um, I uh, am excited to have my colleagues sitting in front of you today uh, to talk about um, From Barriers to Possibilities, Rethinking Conventional Assumptions about career pathways for workers with disabilities. Uh, again, you can check out the bios of all of the uh, of all the panel members on uh, using your QR code on the um, uh, on the on the program. And um, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Mike, who is moderating the panel. So over to you, Mike. So I'm really excited to be here today. And I know that there's been a lot of information shared throughout the morning and this part of the afternoon. And I know you're probably crashing, but if you just hang on just a little bit longer, we got some great stuff for you. I'm really excited to introduce our team from CCRW. Um, just to give you a little bit of information about the things that we found, some research that we have, things that we've discovered, some uh, making barriers to possibilities. Uh, on the stage, there's gonna be four of us, myself, my name's Mike. Um, this is Noor Elazari. Uh, this is Noor from, she does the research. Um, Carrie Deer. Carrie Deer is our accessibility consultant. And at the end, we have Selena Joda. Um, uh, Selena is our job developer. And we've set this up in a way today so that we have a, a team style of a presentation. I think probably about 20 or 30 minutes altogether. And then uh, I, there's a lot of information we're going to send your way in that 30 minutes. So um, just sit back, relax. If you have any questions or thoughts, uh, jot them down. And we're going to hold the last, say, 15, 20 minutes, 25 minutes for questions and answers. So let's give you the opportunity to ask us questions. So um, let me start by jumping right ahead with a uh, presentation. Here we go. I'm going to start off with, uh, is it Nora? Oh, it's sorry, the PowerPoint. Did, yeah. Is the PowerPoint up? Yeah. Yes, great. Wonderful. Oh, sorry. Yes. Thank you. I did. I did regret. Sorry, I, I can't see the PowerPoint from where I'm sitting. So I also just wanted to do a, a recognition of the, of the land that we're on. Uh, here we are on the traditional lands of the uh, Algonquin peoples and the Anishinaabe. Uh, and we are still here on the land which is occupied by many First Nations, Inuit and, um, uh, sorry, I missed that last part. And, and thank you and thank for the caring for the land for all of this time. Again, let's start with Noor, and uh, who is our researcher? Just checking. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Um, so we wanted to begin this presentation with a recent global example of how conventional work life has changed completely. Just making sure we're on the right slide. Of course, I am talking about the COVID-19 pandemic and how it changed the way we work in both positive and negative ways. Before I begin, I just wanted to briefly mention that all of the findings I'll be talking about um, in these few slides came from the latest issue of CCRW's Trends Report, released in the winter of 2023. Uh, the research team at CCRW does a national scan of emerging and latest trends in Canada's workplace disability landscape. And you can actually sc uh, scan the QR code over there in the slide to access the full report. You can also expect to see a new issue of our report coming up, so be sure to check CCRW's website intermittently where it will be uploaded and housed. Okay, so turning back to the COVID-19 pandemic. We already knew how people with disabilities experience greater barriers to employment than those without disabilities at baseline. But with the pandemic, as in-person business halted from national health measures, those sectors that rely heavily on in-person interactions like service, retail, and blue-collar labor experienced the most job loss. And since persons with disabilities are disproportionately employed in those sectors, they experienced more job loss or at least a greater risk to job loss. These effects were also compounded from those jobs also being more likely to be precarious, like part-time, contract, or gig work, and insecure or non-unionized work. 
And so these statistics paint a picture of a greater COVID-19 economic risk and loss for persons with disabilities specifically. Next slide, please. And so this was shown to be the case, at least in an April 2020 labor force survey. It measured an 11% decrease in employment for workers with disabilities, and over one third of persons with disabilities reporting job loss who were working before the pandemic occurred. If a person had more than one disability, again, this showed compounding effects and reported job loss increased uh, by 10%. Next slide. So in the same vein, when we talk about compounding effects, another example of how these effects impact persons with disabilities is when we consider intersectional identity. Here we have an example of Indigenous status. So for non-Indigenous persons, discrimination was reported at 24% of the time. And for Indigenous persons without a disability, discrimination was reported at 22% of the time. But shockingly, if you are both Indigenous with a disability, reported discrimination doubles to nearly half of the time. And so I've shown in these few slides uh, just two examples of the compounding effects of disability when it comes to life events and identity. And so this sounds like a lot of bad news for our mission, um, but all of these unfortunate statistics are not meant to discourage progress in redeveloping career growth. So please bear with us. There's still more to this panel. There's a lot more to this panel because these findings provide us with more knowledge of how barriers impact persons with disabilities, how the effects of barriers can be compounded when it comes to identity and life events. And they also provide more detail on the real life experiences of work and livelihoods of persons with disabilities over a period of time. And so with that knowledge in mind, we can then begin to develop more informed strategies in overcoming barriers to career development, um, and further advance employment and success for our candidates. So with this knowledge, I'm going to turn over to Selena to talk a bit about how CCRW models disability and work um, and how we provide success to our candidates. Thank you, Noor, for kicking us off with those facts. And that's why it's so important for us to continue to broach and implement the social model for disability, which I will now change this. Slide. Oh. Yeah. Um, this model is being widely used and accepted while challenging the traditional medicine model, as we might have heard from other panels today. And it asks us to reconsider the onus of accommodating and ex making accessible spaces for individuals who have disabilities to our social environment and to that of employers to rescind these ableist policies that are currently in place. And these strategies help to enable service providers and employment supports such as the CCRW to provide possibilities and to reconsider these assumptions around people with disabilities who enter the workplace. As this plan will con or as this panel will continue to reconsider, removing barriers through disability confidence training at the skill building level is just the tip of the iceberg. And I say this with confidence because this is the work that we do daily. <clears throat> Um, in my in my role as a frontline career development practitioner, um, there have been many moments where I unfortunately have come across the people in those statistics nor brought up. And the economy is not making it easier for people with disabilities to find employment in any industry in all levels, from entry to senior. And the fact that one in five Canadians identify with a disability only heightens how disproportionate these employment gaps are becoming. So to bridge these gaps, oh, sorry, uh, to bridge these gaps and how they are impacting individuals when considering their pathways, we need to understand where they are occurring. And while there are no definitive starting points, many of the fears and anxieties that people with disabilities are facing happen in the application process, where the feelings of being isolated and excluded are experienced because they're unable to navigate or access those online formats. I've also seen it in the recruitment process in which they become fearful of their identity and resort to masking themselves as to not ruin their chances because of stereotypes and biases surrounding people with disabilities. While onboarding, they become uncomfortable asking for accommodations as to not add undue hardship or appearing as needing more than their counterparts. And even when employed, 12% of Canadians who 
identify with disabilities have reported that they have been refused work because of their disability. They are also facing pay inequities as employees I've personally met who have expressed their disability and are be, and as being on the spectrum and are being paid less than their colleagues in some roles by a staggering 10%. <laughs> So reinforcing this social model for disability and partnering with service providers, such as the CCRW, allow for these spaces to be abolished. And this is because it enables opportunities to flourish and grow rather than focusing on the barriers that limit potential. And in my time with the CCRW, I've had the honor to support job seekers and employers alike to integrate these practices into various sectors, some of which include administration and operations, social work and social services healthcare, finance, the trade sector, UX design, and so much more. And these placements are made possible because of the ability that disability confidence training creates and the social model that has been created to break that glass ceiling and implement these accessible policies. And with that, it's also with skill building. And that is where I'm gonna go back to Noor who's going to share some really great facts about soft skill building. Thank you, Selena. So you can just, yep, that's the right slide. Um, so to add on to Selena's presentation of what CCRW does, we wanted to share the general findings of our candidates in one of our skill building models. So I began this panel with a lot of bad news. And now I can redeem myself here and talk a bit about more hopeful findings we've collected. So if you haven't heard of the Government of Canada's nine skills for success, these were defined as the skills needed to participate and thrive in learning, work, and life. CCRW adapted these nine skills into e-learning modules for candidates to work through, with additional support from a learning coach to define which skills each candidate wants to work on. So this is a self-directed model, and before and after each e-learning module, candidates complete assessments self-reporting their level of confidence in doing tasks associated with each skill. So for example, if a candidate wanted to develop their communication skills, their pre and post assessment will ask them something like, I can navigate challenging conversations during meetings as one of the items. And then the e-learning module would focus on developing those detailed sub-skills. Next slide, please. So at the beginning of the candidate's journey, they can select which skills they want to work on, or they can choose all of the skills to develop. Here we can see that creativity and innovation, digital and problem-solving skills are among the lowest scored skills and confidence ratings. And then we can also see how reading, numeracy, and collaboration skills on average are the highest scored skills. So this is at baseline, um, the average of all nine skills, but we're going to see in the next slide where the most growth occurs. So here we can see the difference scores between pre and post assessments. And we can see that the skills that were reported lowest on average also report the greatest improvement in that exact order. On average, all skills increase by at least 10 points. And so we can say that our e-learning modules work to help the candidate learn and develop their skills to a degree where at least they report higher confidence in applying them. And so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Carrie to talk about her work in fostering the Red Seal, uh, Red Seal skilled trades. Thank you, Noor. To start my piece of the segment, um, next slide. Perfect. I'm going to start, I'm going to wait for Mike, <laughs> uh, with some facts about the Red Seal trades and uh, some numbers. There won't be a test afterwards, and some of these numbers you may already be familiar with, and some may kind of shock you a little bit. Uh, but for those of you who don't know, we are um, in a shortage of Red Seal trade workers in Canada. There are 700,000 skilled trade workers estimated to leave the field and retire between 2019 and 2028. So that's only five years from now. To meet that demand, we need to hire 75,000 apprentices per year. The construction industry alone will need, by 2030, 309,000, 100,000, sorry, 309,000 workers that's a, that's a huge gap. 
The other astounding piece of uh, statistic is that 43% of individuals that start their apprenticeships do not finish. And that's one of the things that we're working on at CCRW is to try to help apprentices get to their Red Seal trade examination successfully. Next slide, please. So we know that Red Seal certification is in demand. And I'm gonna quote here, France DeVoe, the executive director from the Canadian Apprenticeship Forum. And she said that the, the current job pool is not sustainable without concrete efforts to bring in populations that are currently severely underrepresented, namely women, indigenous people, and people with disabilities. So in order to be able to do that, we feel like we need to be able to educate people and to really help those people that do have disabilities remove barriers and to make it a more comfortable position for employers and educators alike. Next slide, please. Most of us here are aware that disabilities are common. 22% of Canadians have a disability and that number can grow any day with any of us joining that group. Most disabilities, nearly 80%, are not immediately visible or invisible. Things such as PTSD, mental health, low back pain. We can look around today and many of us may, may not know that someone sitting next to us does suffer from any of these things or, or has any of these barriers. One in 10 Canadians have a learning difference. One thing we're just really starting to talk about in Red Seal Trades is neurodivergence. Through our programming at CCRW, we're able to be able to follow apprentices throughout their schooling journey and also their on the job site journey. And those two journeys aren't always uh, the same, right? Some people who do great on the job site, maybe have some, some issues uh, within school and need accommodation there. So we're able to work with them with this. And we're really trying to, to let employers and educators and even apprentices know that there's much diversity in disability. Next slide. In working with apprentices and employers and educators, we try to remove barriers. We do this by coming up with accommodations that help it, that help solution issues that individuals may have. Job or school modifications or tools or resources to better complete their tasks may occur. Allowing more time for tasks involving reading and writing. Simply providing a laptop and audio module software. E-reader pens for reading and comprehension barriers. We had a gentleman just a couple months ago who was dyslexic and he was in his school block and he was in school all, all day long and his wife was working all day long. And after coming home and preparing dinner together and putting their six-year-old to sleep, she would read to him so that he could, he could test, hopefully, uh, to the best of his ability because he was unable to read. When we talked to him and told him that, you know, we, we can equip you with a laptop that has the software that goes from audio or from text to audio, he was very excited because he had no idea. So that alleviated so much stress off his own relationship, gave him so much more confidence. And he did very well in his, uh, in his exams, which he was very excited about. We also told him about an e-reader pen, which, and he was in his mid thirties, he had never heard of before. So that e-reader pen was able to give him confidence and newfound abilities in the classroom, at work, and in everyday life. He told me the first thing he was excited to do was to go to the grocery store and bring that e-reader pen to be able to read, you know, things on the box that maybe he wasn't familiar with. Um, wireless, wireless devices to enhance communication for employees with hearing limitations. Lift assistive devices. And I'm not just talking dollies to help us move things, which that's definitely one as well, but things such as exosuits. And uh, I know we were mentioning in the last um, in the last session about smart arms. Like there's so many different things out there that can help with accommodation. 
And I'm going to say next slide and give it back to Selena. She's going to talk a little bit more about accommodations and disability confidence. Yeah, thank you so much, Carrie, for starting that conversation on why access to accommodations are so important. And building that awareness is just a fundamental element to the work that we as employment support providers are doing. So to reiterate uh, Carrie's point, I've included a graphic from the Diversity Institute, which is a research lead for the Future Skills Center in, in Toronto. And it displays the most common accommodations needed and is split by disability severity. And that information is referenced and sourced from Stats Canada and developed using the social model of disability. Um, this label is not to is not a judgment concerning a person's level or disability um, severity. It's it is mainly a name assigned to facilitate its use in the research. It's actually quite fascinating, and I would definitely implore everyone to use it or to look into it after this panel. Um, but going back to the graphic, it does include modified hours or reduced work hours, um, modified or different duties, a modified or ergonomic workstation and the option to work from home. Many of these accommodations that individuals are asking for cost little to implement, but as we've heard today, employers still bulk when people with disabilities ask for accommodations because it's supposedly too expensive. So this translates to folks being uncomfortable and fearful for asking for accommodations despite legislation requiring employers to provide reasonable accommodations. And I'm going to bring it back to Carrie, because while there are so many employers who are bulking, we do have a lot of great success stories on how our clients or how our candidates are getting the support that they need through accommodations. So next, I'm going to share a testimonial of uh, one of our female apprentices. Uh, so at the intersection of having uh, a disability and being a female, she speaks of herself. So being a female glazing apprentice has been a truly empowering and rewarding experience. Breaking stereotypes and challenging gender norms in a traditionally male-dominated field has been a journey of resilience and determination. Embracing this opportunity has not only opened doors for me in the glazing industry, but throughout the trades. I hope to inspire more women to pursue their careers in the trades. Shani. And if you look at that picture, it is actually a picture of her as a woman with a disability overlooking Halifax Harbor. Oh, oh, oh it's not there. Sorry. There's Shani. A piece of her. Mike, Mike is in a little piece of her as well. But you can see that you, you what you can't see on there is she actually does have a harness on. And I checked that right from the beginning when she sent the photo. Um, but I think that just says so much, you know, that she can look out. It's a bright future. And she's doing exactly what she wanted to do and what she loves to do. And did she need some supports to get there? Absolutely. Is she appreciative of that? She sure is. And she wants to tell other people just... Uh, just that you know they can do that too. She really wants to touch on that empowerment piece. Next slide. Oh, there she was. Yep, in full form. <laughs> That's okay. There you go. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and for my concluding slide, not the end though. I'm going to send it back over to Nora in just a second. But what we're really trying to do here is bridge the gap. Um, Red Seal Trades is uh, definitely a different uh, area to talk to people about disabilities. Uh, it has its challenges, and uh, I've talked to many of you here in the room about those challenges. Uh, so, But we do try to, to teach, to educate what is a disability. We talked a little bit about diversity of disability, and we're trying to, to have everyone look through that lens. We're encouraging partnerships, working with educators, employers, other community groups, to really try to understand how we can be better. We're working on building strong relationships. We feel that they're essential to successfully recruiting and placing people with disabilities in apprenticeship training. And most of the success stories we have have involved good relationships among inter intermediaries, such as ourselves, training organizations, and employers. We have a wonderful research team, and I'm not just saying that because Nora's next to me. Um, and, and they look at uh, some of the things that we're touching on now, you know, having apprentices in work 
and uh, and in the school training session or portion. And uh, Nora's going to share a little bit more information about their research findings. Thank you for that, Carrie. So you can go ahead and change the slide. Thank you. Um, so we've introduced our goal of bridging gaps. But to first bridge a gap, you need to identify it, right? And so we wanted to end this panel by introducing um, the preliminary findings of our new project that spotlights one of the most potentially impactful life experiences for persons with disabilities or any person who has had this experience. And I'm talking about a person's transition from their post-secondary education to work. And I think the last uh, session spoke uh, briefly on that. Um, so barriers do not only exist in the workplace, and we know that. They exist also before employment, in education, where skills and opportunities are first experienced. We know from older findings that education achievement gaps exist disproportionately for persons with disabilities, and that this effect is also seen in the workforce as well. So our research project, which has launched this month, uh, surveys the educational, career, and long-term goals of post-secondary students with disabilities. Next slide, please. So far, we've accumulated about 100 responses, most of which come from domestic students who are enrolled in a four-year undergraduate degree. The average age of our respondents is around 23 years old, and they're typically living either in a suburban or urban area. We have a word map up here of the most commonly reported fields of study. And so you can see here we have a diverse group of scholars, engineering, psychology majors, history and English majors, biology, administration, accounting, and the list goes on. Next slide, please. Next, we asked questions about their disability characteristics, and we had about a 50-50 split of invisible and visible disability type. Over 70% reported chronic or permanent disability, and nearly 25% reported an episodic disability. We see here in the figure a varied mixed bag group of uh, all of the disability types that we had measured. Um, so we captured uh, every type that we could. Um, and the most commonly reported disability type was mental health, followed by learning, developmental, and mobility, all at about the same levels. Um, and this also was reflective of uh, the CCRW candidate pool, um, where mental health was uh, the most reported uh, disability type. Next slide, please. And so finally, we are to tie it all together, we wanted to investigate the career goals of these students. And so far, we've seen that undergraduate students who have disabilities are fairly optimistic in their career goals. 94% expect to find employment in their chosen field of study, and 75% expect to find that employment within six months of graduating, or after graduating, excuse me. For their salary goals, most respondents chose either at or above the expected salary range of forty dollars to $50,000 for their first entry-level position. And this is compared to a 2022 Ontario University graduate survey, which recorded a 90% employment rate in a six-month period and 83% of work being related to their university-acquired skills. And so at the end of this project, we hope to shed light on these barriers and facilitators and also the goal setting behavior of students with disabilities to hopefully in the long run encourage more higher quality educational and career opportunities. Thanks for listening. Okay, that's awesome information. Thank you so much. Um, I recognize that the time is running out, so I want to give as much time as possible for the audience to participate here with questions. Um, so let's give a 20 minutes left that we have in this session, but I do have a question for Noor, and that, that's, that'll be my only question for the panel, and then I'll give it to the audience. I wanted to talk a little bit about, or maybe you could talk a little bit about what your research findings in the previous assessment, and what is the lowest confidence area? Like, uh, I saw that it was creativity. I know the two of us talked about this briefly. Um, wondering, it's a little bit strange that people with disabilities, like it's almost, 
in every different uh, aspect of their lives. They have to use creativity for getting through the day-to-day -day lives at work. So it's it's interesting that it's that the expectation of most create the being most creative is seems to be the hardest uh, barrier that they have. So why is it so low? Do you mind responding to that? Yeah, so I, I agree, that is surprising. Um, so Mike is talking about the nine skills for success assessments and how creativity and innovation was among the lowest scored. And you know, anecdotally, we could say um, persons with disabilities have to be the most innovative and creative in order to survive and thrive. Um, they have to think outside of the box in order to uh, gain more uh, opportunities um, and experiences. And so why are they, why are the reports the lowest in these skills for success assessments at the beginning? Um, and I don't have a full answer. My best guess is that these are self-reported confidence assessments, right? So they don't actually measure the skills of the uh, candidate. And so maybe the, this could be a potential blind spot to our candidates who have these skills, uh, but they don't see them having these skills, right? And so this could be a good thing where we are able to spotlight skills that people don't know that they actually have. Um, or maybe they do think that they're creative and innovative, but they don't know how to apply that into a uh, workplace environment. And so that's my best guess why creativity and innovation was uh, low, lowest for it. Good question. Yeah, that's good. That's great. But um, that, thank you for answering that. Sorry, <laughs> that's really important. Yes, of course. Yeah, but I find it strange that the confidence aspect is, um, as a as a person, as a deaf person. having that difficulty relating to the workplace and, and the creativity that's required when you enter a workplace, just to have a full understanding of my ideas about, um, you know, do you have any ideas on, on suggestions that could that could be more beneficial for, for people to, to make that confidence gap, that, that leap across the confidence gap that they have? Or perhaps, a, and I have a couple more questions, but I think I'll open that up to questions from the audience now. If you just wouldn't mind raising your hand and then we can go around. Somebody has got a microphone, is it? So, Marie, I guess, yeah. Auntie? Hi, Mike. Yeah, I, I, I'm talking from many people who uh, support those with disabilities in employment. There's a lot of gaps. I'm talking about agencies and organizations and the employment counselors. Um, it seems like, whether it's college or university, post-secondary or, or employment, the skills of self-advocacy don't seem to be there. I'm wondering if any of you on the stage could make a brief com comment about that area of study. So perhaps somebody on the stage here, Mike. Yeah, and I think that's a really great point. And I think as some of the other panels here have kind of discussed, I think where this disability confidence and awareness needs to start is before the transition into the workplace. And I think having these conversations and having these supports set in place from those formative years in school and depending high school, college, university, um, even if they take a gap, um, I think it it would definitely help with that self-advocacy process to really be able to voice what they're looking for in the workplace. And if I can add to that as well. Yeah. Um, I also I also feel like just speaking with apprentices, one of the first things, you know, we ask is is about a disability and, you know, can you describe your disability or your barrier to us? And I, and I had a lady just not too long ago. Uh, she told me she didn't, dis she didn't identify with a disability. And then she carried on to tell me that she was a victim of domestic abuse. She had pins and plates in her shoulder. She had a clavicle that would never uh, join again. She had two fractured vertebrae, PTSD, um, ADHD and severe anxiety and stress and depression. But remember, she didn't identify as having a disability. And so then, and sorry, and I should have disclosed that she also is going into be an automotive technician. So a very physical, physical job. So when we further got into discussion, um, you know, I had mentioned to her about her job and, and you know, what were, what her future would look like as having, you know, these 
barriers, these physical barriers. And she said, well, my doctor told me that I would be in pain, so I'm just going to live with it. To where uh, we had an intervention to be able to get an assessment done. So this lady now, you know, the occupational therapist, physiotherapy team went in to be able to look and see, you know, what positions can you work in better? What, what sort of devices can you use? Um, are there certain tools you should be using that's you know, better up to, to your position. So I think a lot of times it's just that education piece of people not knowing whether it's an employer, whether it's, uh, you know, a, a person who wants to become employed, um, an apprentice or what have you, sometimes people are just not aware that they can have help and what those, what those pieces could be. So I think education is a big part of that. We have another question right. over here. Thanks. Yeah. I saw that. I guess my, my, I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Carlos Sosa. I uh, come from Winnipeg. Um, I am a union member. I'm also involved in a uh, supported employment project in Winnipeg called the Community Safety House Initiative. So that prioritizes the hiring of those who are primarily Indigenous, primarily those that have been involved in the child welfare system, people with disabilities, and those who identified as LGBTQ. Um, and so the idea is you bring lived experience into these spaces, uh, pay people a living wage. So my question is, um, you talk about lived experience, but I think we need to go further than that, is where do you see the value of advocacy for some of these supported employment initiatives? Because it's not just about getting people apprenticeships, we also need to advocate to government to support initiatives in communities, which make makes communities more inclusive. And so uh, I just want to get your thoughts about the advocacy piece uh, for these initiatives, because it's not just about the job. We also need to push governments to invest in programs which hire people. Absolutely. I'll, I'll start with that. Um, thank you very much. Great question. And that's part of our mission is the advocacy piece. So um, We've been working with lots of other um, community partners. Uh, we work with Skills Trades Canada. We've been working with uh, the Canadian Apprenticeship Forum, really trying to spread the word, really trying to let people know that there are supports out there. And by working together, we can we can remove a lot of those barriers and we can be more supportive. Um, just last month, and everything is last month to me, maybe it was the month before, um, I was at a conference held by the Canadian Apprenticeship Forum, and it was on global best practice, you know, and to see that uh, screen come up with neurodivergence on it, like the, the fact that we're talking about that now in this, in this space, in the trade space, especially, uh, you know, speaking of apprenticeships, is a beautiful thing, because once we're aware of that, and we can stand up and say, you know what, I'm here to help that as well, I think that's where we, where we uh, can make progress and go further. And okay, thank you for that question. Is there another one? Hi, my name's Heather. Um, when I was 16 years old, which was a very long time ago, more than 50 years ago, I applied at BCIT to become a carpenter. And they, they willingly took my application and said, now you need a signed uh, letter from an employer guaranteeing they will hire you as an apprentice, and to which I then had to run around and find one, not thinking, well, screw you. Um, I instead found one, found an employer. Oh, yeah, we'll hire you, no problem. So then they contacted the employer and said, you don't want to hire her. And they said, why? Well, you know, she's only 16. She doesn't know what she wants. She'll probably get pregnant, have a baby, and quit, and take up the space a man should take. Not much has changed since then, it sounds like. Um, now we also, and my, fortunately I made it through and I, my trade is as a carpenter. Um, I'm not practicing anymore because the houses might get a lot of wonky because I can't see well enough. But the safety on the job, the micro and macro aggressions against women the micro and macro aggressions against people in the LBGTQ community is really something you don't expect once you fight through and get there. And then you're in situations of possibly being raped or harmed. We need to go beyond 
getting people to the job. We need to be there to ensure that people are in safer spaces, because sometimes not all of us feel safe in a space. But these are important considerations too. When we look at the road to good employment, we also have to look at um, ensuring safety within those employment. And I think that's another layer um, as well as, you know, good uh, um, equipment and technology for employment um, or just to ensure someone can do the job well. Um, have you had anyone come back or anybody that's mentioned this or is this something we can start talking about even more of? Is this the responsibility of the employer to ensure safety and not say, well, I never heard about it, so it doesn't exist, but to take an active space in ensuring that. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your story and great question and very serious question. So um, in trying to uh, advocate, we've been working with lots of different community uh, stakeholders and we've been working recently with the Office to Advance Women Apprenticeship and your story from, I don't know how many years ago, what is the same story that I heard at that table last week, and this is 2023, right? So it's it's still out there, it still exists. Um, it's very unfortunate. We are trying to to work harder, I think, as I mean, everyone here, I'm, I'm sure we all, we all kind of understand more and we're more aware of a lot of the issues out there, but we're really trying to educate. We're really trying to make sure that people are included, whether it is a disability, whether it is a gender issue, wh whatever that is, whatever that difference is, is making it acceptable, right? And I think it's it's employers, but it's also the coworkers. It's also the people that they're working with, because a lot of times, you know, the, the management may not even be aware that this is happening. So I, I think it's important um, not just to make sure that uh, the coworkers are aware of situations, but also that they are sharing their knowledge or, or they're, account they're accountable for what's happening as well, whether it be to management or to, to their coworkers to try and help. But it definitely is an issue. Uh, I think we're hopefully on our way to making it better, but we certainly are not, not there yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just to add on to what Carrie is saying, I think your question is a great one that speaks to the larger question of why accessibility is part of DEI trainings and that confidence building. Um, in my time also as a job developer, I've encountered individuals who, I'm thinking of a specific one, who he identifies as a uh, trans man. Um, however, while transitioning in the workplace, uh, he was assaulted for his um, identity and he had to leave his place of employment. And he found that this was something that would follow him. And it's something that has made him fearful to work with people, unfortunately. And this is something that again, goes to the fact that it's not just policy changes that need to happen on the upper level with leadership, but it's starting that conversation with your coworkers to build that not even just rapport, but to build that level of protection so that they're aware of the fact that their actions can hurt and that they're the way that they are treating others in the workplace, even if they don't mean it as a, as a slight, it can be harmful and it can be um, detrimental to their identity. I also recently had to work with someone who, while they identified as Black, later it, towards the conversation, they mentioned to me that they were indigenous. And as part of our equity seeking questions, we I, I asked those questions and I mentioned, oh, did I not ask you this? Um, because I have here that you're not. And she said to me, I can't identify as indigenous because I present as black. And it has to do with a lot of issues that go back to her ban and, the, and her acceptance within her community. And it just goes to show how important setting those policies and having these conversations with intersectionality really go to show why they don't work one by one. They have to work together. And we can't just stop or focus the conversation on one aspect when identity needs to be taken as a whole. That's great, a question in the back there. 
Hi, my name is John Waters. I'm a uh, retired probation officer who worked in adult and youth probation here this, for the province of Ontario. And um, one of the things I'm just sort of interested in, which I sort of saw from my experience, I'm a person with a hearing and uh, learning disability, so a hidden disability, um, is the role that managers play, because um, they're usually the first ones you're dealing with with respect to accommodation. The first is obviously at the job interview um, and how basically awareness that is being provided to managers. I found from my experience, sometimes managers were being diplomatically clueless about accommodation issues. And also when you are eventually hired, um, how they, but for that, like for training, because often, you know, you need accommodation for training to develop your career, whether it be specialized training or mandatory training. And there's been challenges with respect to accommodation. I've had face barriers where I put requests in for accommodation, uh, but they yeah, and usually and I end up I go to the training, and it doesn't it doesn't happen the way it should have happened, and um, in, which causes issues and all that. So I just want maybe just a commentary about uh, the about managers, especially the frontline managers, being aware of and being sensitive to accommodation requests. Oh, do you want to add anything from the from the panel up here? Does anybody have want to take a stab at that? Yeah, I think you bring up a really great point in that where frontliners are getting their resources, even if leadership is creating these amazing leadership practices and guidelines and trainings for staff, it's important that not only are they involved in it, but they are actively making sure that people are not only just clicking through said module or just talking it into existence, but they're presenting those actions, making sure microaggressions don't happen in the workplace, making sure that voices are being heard and doing more than just like a monthly well-being um, seminar or activity or team bonding situation. It's, I think it really does help when the managers are also the ones that are advocating for their employees. Great. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, I need to wrap this up. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. But I also wanted to thank uh, all of you who have pre pre prepared questions. Uh, I think it's uh, I know you've got a lot of unanswered things and some things that have, you've seen today. So I appreciate having the touching on a lot of the different uh, subject areas. Uh, our trends report is available on our website, uh, or you can scan the QR link. Um, I really encourage you to go through that. It's some great information. Um, thanks very much, and I'll bring it back to Maureen. Wow. <clears throat> so I get the pleasure of working with these folks all the time, and I uh, was amazed. You blew me away. Thank you very much for all of your insight, for your preparation, for um talking to us about how stories and statistics matter right and how and how in, in each of the stories that you told and each of the statistics that you backed it up with is really important as we move forward as one of the questions for 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 that policy change so um so you done did me proud so thank you very much and uh and so we'll give a big round of applause to the panel <laughs>